doesn't take God long to show you where you can find a real blessing, you know. Find a real blessing in Daniel and his family, I'll tell you for sure. You ever wonder why the Lord's so good to us? I mean, we've had some of the best talent that you could have anywhere in the world. Here at little old Bruceville Baptist Church. Isn't that amazing? We serve a great God, you know it? God is good. All the time. God is good. I plan to preach this morning the message that I had planned to preach last Sunday. And God interrupted last Sunday. And I'm sure glad He did. Wasn't Anthony's testimony a blessing last Sunday? Amen. Tell you this, I, I told Anthony, I've told him several times, Anthony and I met in pastor's study for about two hours together yesterday. I told him again, I said, Anthony, you've got one of the greatest testimonies I've ever heard in my life. And you need to find an avenue to get that testimony out to people. Of course, it's going to be on YouTube because all of our services go out on YouTube. I don't know if you knew that or not, but all of our services go out on YouTube. So when Frank gets it up, eventually, <laughs> it'll be on YouTube. And as I told Frank this morning, I hope once we get it up, I hope lots and lots of people hear that testimony on YouTube. And I hope it opens some doors for Anthony to get to go places and share his testimony because it's such a great testimony. He was literally brought back from the dead, literally. He, they told his parents he's dead, unplug him, and they wouldn't do it. And uh, Mama's got a great testimony about that, don't you, Mama? And uh, it's amazing, simply amazing. And see, I had planned to preach last Sunday on the resurrection of Lazarus. And instead, God wanted us to have a testimony of a modern-day resurrection. See, God's still in the business of raising the dead. God's still in the business of doing miracles. Folks, we serve a miracle-working God. There's nothing that God... The Bible says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And that's one of those rhetorical questions in the Bible. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the obvious answer is no. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. How many times have you heard this preacher say, God can do anything He wills and chooses to do just because He's God. And the devil and all the demons in hell and all the unbelievers and agnostics and atheists in the world can't stop it. God's going to do whatever God chooses to do because He's God. And at one time, God chose Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead. John chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. You know, I'd love to be in Lazarus' position in that verse. It specifically says, Lord, whom thou lovest, he whom thou lovest is sick. Lazarus was so loved by Jesus, but I got news for you. You're so loved by Jesus too. Jesus loves you and me just as much as he loved Lazarus. He whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, we don't understand what that means at this juncture in the story, but we'll see what it meant later on. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, listen to this, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. You know what that tells us? The simple fact that Jesus doesn't always do what we expect Him to do. If Jesus really loved Lazarus as much as the Bible says He did, 
and he heard that Lazarus was sick, why didn't he immediately go and heal Lazarus? Wouldn't that be the logical thing for Jesus to do as the healer? But that's not what he did. And in your life and mine, I found out Jesus won't always do what you expect him to do. He might do something entirely different that might blow your gourd. But he's going to do what he's going to do. After that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Now what do you think he meant when he said that? Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now we reach the almost seemingly impossible situation. Lazarus is dead. Graveyard dead. Lazarus is dead. We all believe, and I know Carmen and Dennis believe, Anthony was dead. For all practical purposes, Anthony was dead. Lazarus is dead. And that's seemingly the impossible situation. When death comes and breath leaves the body, we give up hope. But Jesus doesn't. Verse 15 says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you may believe, nevertheless let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. See, going back to Judea, that's where they wanted to kill Jesus before. And the disciples have got in their mind now, they may kill Jesus when we get back to Judea. So we'll just go and die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Four days stone yard dead. Bethany was now in Jerusalem about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Mary, Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now they didn't understand at the time what he meant by that. We're going to see in a minute. But the point is, impossible situations like the death of Lazarus. Impossible situations bring new and higher revelations. Jesus is fixing, is fixing to show them a whole new revelation of who he was and what he could do. Now they knew him as the healer. They knew that Jesus had opened blind eyes, opened deaf ears. They knew that Jesus had healed cripples, healed lepers. They already knew that. His reputation was spread far and wide as a healer. So they knew him as the healer. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She was saying, Jesus, I know that even though he's dead now, 
In the last day at the great resurrection, he'll be resurrected just like all of us will if we die before Jesus comes again. Jesus saith unto him, unto her, unto him. Jesus saith unto her. Here, here, here's the new and higher revelation. I am the resurrection and the life. What a bold statement. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, Jesus was saying, I control life and death. I decide who dies and who lives. Oftentimes when one of our loved ones, we lose a loved one, one of our good friends or relative dies, we say, God, why? Do you know what you're doing? Why them? Why now? Why me, Lord? Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. What a statement. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. How many of you never plan to die? Do you know if you're a believer, you're not going to die? You may run out of breath on this earth, but you're not going to die. You're just going to transfer. How many times have you heard me say, I've preached it for over 54 years, and every time I say it, I believe it more than the time I said it before. I believe with every fiber of my being. I believe with my heart of hearts. When I draw my last breath of earthly air down here, I'll draw my first breath of heavenly air up there. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you're a believer, when you draw your last breath of earthly air down here, you will draw your first breath of heavenly air up there. You won't be dead. You'll be more alive than you've ever been. And you won't have to worry about arthritis. You won't have to worry about pneumonia. You won't have to worry about kidney stones. You won't have to worry about gall stones. You won't have to worry about the flu. You won't have to worry about having a cold. You won't have to worry about thyroid problems, Dennis. You won't have to worry about anything because there'll be no more sorrow, no more death, no more sickness, the land of no mores. I don't know about you, but being past 80 years of age, I'm looking more forward to it all the time. I couldn't be too far away. I'll tell you one thing I know for sure. I lived a whole lot more in my past life than I'm going to live in my future life down here on earth. Unless I live to be over 160, and I doubt very seriously if I will. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Let me ask you, do you believe that? If you believe that, you're not going to die. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which had come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Listen to this, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She echoed what Martha had said because both of them knew Jesus as the healer. They knew that he could have, that he could have healed Lazarus if he had been there and Lazarus wouldn't have died. But Jesus is showing them a newer and higher revelation. Amen? When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weep, weeping which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Again, I want to ask, how many of you have followed or seen the series The Chosen? 
You remember when it showed when Jesus wept? To me, that was such a vivid picture of Jesus. Did you know that? By the way, did you know that's the most memorized verse in all the Bible, 11, John eleven thirty five. It's the most memorized by a Bible verse in, in every child's mind. You know why? Because it's two words. Jesus wept. I bet you all learned that real early, didn't you? Jesus wept. But what a vivid picture. Jesus, God in the flesh. Jesus, the Son of God, weeping, crocodile tears. Why? Was he weeping because Lazarus was dead? No. You know why he was weeping? Because Mary and Martha and their friends were weeping and God identified with them. Just like God identifies with you. When you have trouble, when you have problems, when you have tears, Jesus identifies with you. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not, not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? See, see, they had the same idea Mary and Martha did. All the Jews that were there, all the friends of Mary and Martha, they knew the reputation of Jesus. They knew that Jesus had gone around the country healing lame men, healing blind, healing deaf ears, all that. They, they knew He was the healer. There wasn't any doubt or question. Couldn't He have caused this man not to have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. You know what that says to me? There are times when Jesus wants possibilities to be performed by people before he does the impossible. Now, what are some of the possibilities that can be performed by people to expect God to do the impossible? That's right, Carmen. Prayer. That's why in the last few weeks and months, I've tried to emphasize prayer so much in our church. Prayer gets what God can do. You and I do whatever we can do, but that just gets what we can do. But prayer gets what God can do. And that's what's more important. He said, uh, take away the stone. Take away the stone. And they did. They took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. In the chosen, they, choose, they chose to use the words, come out. If you watch the chosen, as he stood before the Stone before the grave, he said, Lazarus, come out. You know what's amazing? When he said that, look at verse 44. When he said that, the Bible says, he that was dead. Hey, I got news for you. Was dead is past tense. As soon as Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, guess what? Lazarus was no longer dead. Lazarus was alive. Because Jesus said, Come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Now why did he say that to them? Because they were the ones that put the grave clothes on him. And he was saying to them, You put the grave clothes on him, now you take the grave clothes off of him. Because he's no longer dead. He's alive. 
He doesn't need grave clothes on if he's alive. Loose him. Let him go. And many of the Jews which came to Mary, seeing the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Folks, only Jesus can do the impossible. Only Jesus can stand at the grave and say, come forth, come out. If you and I happen to be in the grave before Jesus comes again, guess what? He's going to say the same thing to you that he said to Lazarus. He's going to come in the clouds and he's going to say, come up, come here, come out, come up. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. How can you keep from saying amen or glory to God or hallelujah or something when I say that? We shall ever be with the Lord. That's the greatest promise that you and I could ever have in this lifetime. We're not only going to be with Him, we're going to be like Him. That's one of my favorite verses of Scripture has always been 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. We shall be like Him. I'm looking at some of you and I'm saying, it's amazing you're going to be like Jesus. And you're looking at me and saying the same thing. Brother Mickey, it's hard to believe knowing what I know about you and your past. It's hard for me to believe you're going to be like Jesus. Hey, it's harder for me to believe than it is for you that I'm going to be like Jesus. But I believe it. In fact, I, I know it. I don't just believe it, I know it. You know how I know it? Because the Bible says so. And if the Bible says it, that's it. How many times have I given you the illustration that when we first moved as pastor of First Baptist Church in Wilmer, Texas in Dallas County to Emmanuel Baptist Church in Abilene, Texas, I was driving around Abilene and saw a bumper sticker. It said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I said, man, I like that. So I'd get up in the pulpit and I'd rant and rave and spit and say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I said that one night in a revival service in New Mobiti, Texas. How many of you know where New Mobiti, Texas is? It's just north of Old Mobiti, Texas. That's a true story. They incorporated North Obiti, Mobiti because they had a fuss among the people. It's kind of like Bruce Valetti, I guess. You know, it used to be Bruce Fuller and Eddie. They got together, I guess, made Bruce Fuller Eddie. But in most people's mind, it's still two separate places. Well, there's Old Mobiti and New Mobiti. Well, I was in New Mobiti, and I preached that. I said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Gray-haired old Methodist retired preacher came out after that revival service and said, Brother Mickey, I enjoyed your message a lot, but there's one thing I'd like to disagree with you on. I said, you would? See, back then, I knew everything. I was young, you know. You weren't supposed to disagree with me because I had it all together. I knew everything. I found out since then there's a few things I'm still learning. But I said, you would? And he said, yeah, there's one thing you said I disagree with. He said, you said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. He said, young man, God said it. That settles it. It don't matter if you believe it or not. And you know what I said? Amen. And ever since then, I just say, God said it, that settles it. Doesn't matter if you or I or anybody else in the world believes it. The agnostics and atheists and all those nominally, they're not going to believe it, but it doesn't change it. Still true. God said it, that settles it. And God said, I and you are going to be like Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful promise?